I'm taking a different approach to this video. I'm not just bringing the news of the Mick Gordon scandal. I'm going to be talking about the greater implications it has, why it happens the way it does, and the true impact on the gaming industry as a whole. Whether you've played Doom or not, you need to watch this video. Marty Stratton, its Software Studio Director, lied about Doom Eternal's OST events in a Reddit post that used disinformation to blame me entirely for its failure. Later, he offered me a six-figure sum to never speak about it. The truth is more important. So to catch you up on what happened super quick, there was a letter on 2020 that Marty Stratton, its software executive director, he released it. He said that Mick was a great composer for the Doom games, but he just missed some deadlines and was not really that great to work with. And we took that as its face value and moved on and said, okay, new composer, that's fine. Well, Mick comes back two years later trying to debunk this letter and a lot of stuff happens. Let's go. The first issue we see is that when Mick signed on, he got two songs per month that he had to compose. He said it was not impossible, but it was tight. And now it was two years away for the release. So we have to look at the situation here and how you would deal with it, right? So when you have something so far away, you need to have the specifics on how to deal with it. And that was not given to Mick. It's almost like he was given the keys to a car and never told what road to drive down. Like he knew how to drive the car. He knew about what you want when you're driving that car, but he didn't know which direction to take it. And as we see here, what we find is that most of the levels were getting still getting blocked out. So the fantasy combat puzzle didn't, did not exist yet. Details were not there. He did not have the information. So if you're at work or if you're at school and they say, here, here's this huge project. You need to work on it and get it done right now. Well, you're thinking, you know, my name's attached to this. This is my reputation as far as Doom goes. Well, I need to get this done, right? But you can kind of see the pressure that Mick was under. And we'll talk here in just a moment about contracts and different things that he had to consider. But you can kind of feel feel for him, right? And, and what adds to this that makes it a, quite a little bit worse was that he talks about there was a contract delay on its software side. This is huge. I talked to a friend of mine about contracts and we got to go over that, what maybe could have been done better. Now, what is interesting is that a two week Paul Hansel deck marketing interruption took six weeks instead. Communications was slow. He had two levels per month and he was having, taking about a week to get back with it. So we want more games, right? That's great, but at what cost? Mick was being pushed to the edge here according to these allegations, and he wants to have quality, but you also want the quantity with it. So it's a really hard, rock and hard place for Mick to be in right now. And I'm sure you can understand, like I said, when you have your own projects and things that you're working with. Now, of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg and it goes much deeper. So as we see, Mick begins to propose a solution. He had done five other Bethesda published titles. He kind of knew what he was going with as a musician. He knows what it takes to produce and what you need to have for timing. However, when you have someone that isn't in that situation, they might not, they might not see it as such. They may be having a more corporate idea saying we need X by Y time. And then the musician says, well, that's not exactly how it works. So you have that bit of a disconnect right there. And you have what the corporate wants and you have what the musician wants. And with the way it works today, you do need to be able to adhere to what the business wants. If you're signing on with the business as a freelancer, contractor does not matter. You have to be able to give the product that they want when they want it to meet their deadlines. You can negotiate as Mick has done, as we see with this email here, but it may not always work. So you have to consider a few other things as well. Guesswork was my only option. No time for iteration, zero wiggle room. Ideally, they would work with them a little bit to find that out. And going back to the project that we mentioned that you may have worked on, you want to have that communication there. You don't want to have that breakdown and all of these other issues. He suggested it. He said that the person that had been working with the plan didn't exactly have the best idea on how this whole thing worked. So that's just basically a communication issue we're running into. This needs to be the way it is. This can't be the way it is, but it has to be the way it is, right? They had unnecessary arguments and expectations like the metal choir recording took months to execute, couldn't be done in the first two weeks. Well, naturally so, that's a huge thing with a ton of singers all in one area being flown in. Naturally, that can't be done in the first two weeks. That's massive. We need to be able to hold freelancers, contractors to the same standards as a W-2 9 to 5 employee as well to be able to say, hey, you're going to need more time. That's fair. Just because you're not on the books as an in-house employee, we're still going to treat you the same way. And it looks to be that Marty had struck that plan down and he was taken aback by the reaction. Now, it says here, the whole email, I would also recommend pausing reading this as well if you would like to, and how they push forward with it. And it seems like the tone and the feel that Mick is getting from this isn't just a, no thanks, we don't want to do it this way. It's a little bit rougher. And this is a bit of foreshadowing as to what we'll approach later in the video as to how this whole situation is handled. 
and we're going to see a couple other interesting things as well. You can tell that all of this music had been mapped out thus far, and some a couple other things happened. Blowouts. Now, this is very important. If you played Doom Eternal, or if you haven't, let me catch up to speed. There's a lot of wandering around in between the fights. It's pacing, right? You do a heavy fight. You want to give your brain a break, so you have a smaller area. And then you have another heavy fight. It's the way the game's designed. Hour-long levels where players traverse fantastic worlds with epic vistas and tricky platforming sections had just 30 seconds allotted to exploration. However, Doom was wall-to-wall -wall music, which made this oversight laughable. So again, we're seeing another disconnect riding off the back of the first one. You want to have a lot of music to fill that area, but you only have 30 seconds of a lot of time to said area. You're going to have a bit of a problem there. So what would Mick do? He would need to space it back out and create more music. That is a very important point for later, okay? Overwhelming. I worked straight for months, trying to stay on top of things, new set of problems, was cut out of music meetings, emails went unanswered, weekly calls with the audio teams were frequently hijacked, heaping lists of problems, and as he summarizes it here, more crunch, less sleep. If you're given a job that you need to do, apparently, this is, okay, if you read the open letter, the, the whole thing said, you know, Mick, he was a great composer, he missed the deadlines, he was tough to work with, and as a community, we saw that, and we said, oh, okay, he needs to be more punctual, on time, take the jobs that he knows he can complete. However, upon hearing Mick's story, we find that there is a little bit more detail that was maybe allegedly, again, left out. Now, what we have finding here is responding to this is going to be difficult because he lays out each and every minutiae of this argument. And so if it does respond, they have to say, oh, open letters, some of the things we said weren't true. If they don't respond, well, they don't give a response. And now everybody's like, you know, we're waiting for something to say. It's not a good situation either where you cut it, and being someone that has liked id Software for 30 years now, and who also really appreciates Mick Music, ah, this one's tough, but it gets worse, and it's not just Doom. Well, what do I mean, not just Doom? Let's talk about that. See, the whole point of this video is not to be a simple news break, like, hey, this is what happened, which those are fine, I've done those plenty of times before, but there's a greater issue within the gaming industry that affects us as players. If you remember recently, there was a Bayonetta incident with the voice actor and payment, and a whole drama came from that. It was supposed to be this way, but it was actually that way. And when the truth came out, the community was like, oh, this is different than it was supposed to be. If you look even further back to Kojima and Metal Gear Solid, how he was axed from that project. You know, Call of Duty, all, the, all these other games and things. Is there an issue, a wider issue that affects the players? Well, okay, this is just the devs, right? How does it actually affect us as players? Hmm, pay issues. It absolutely does. So he had a couple tracks, I know this is 15,000 words, he had a couple tracks that were put in for the use here, and they were used in the game, and he wasn't paid for them. We're going to talk more about that in a second. When you go to your job, tell me this, when you go to your job, you expect to be paid, right? You do the work you are ascribed to do, you get the paycheck. However, Mick had quite the delay in this that we need to talk about withheld approvals and therefore payment for months. Beginning in January 2019, I went 11 months without pay, and this was after nine months without pay. A whole lot of, a whole lot of drama here with that, of course. And we look at uncertainty and crunch, rejections, lack of approval, endless demands. We'll keep going with that. The announcement of the Doom Eternal soundtrack makes it a bit worse. You know you want paid when you go to your job. He wasn't getting it. Okay, so what does Mick do next? How do you counter something like this happening? The soundtrack announcement is how. So as a business, you want to have good business practices and not poor. You want to be able to have everything reflect properly on what you do. And I feel like this next section is a bit rough. And I actually talked to a few people to get some more insight on this. You'll see here in just a minute. So the E3 showcase, June 6, 2019, Marty Ridley said that Doom Internal will release on November 22nd with a special collector's edition. Now, the pre-orders went on sale immediately. This is good, right? There's the hype. As a player, you say, oh man, this is so cool. Doom Eternal, new game, collector's edition. Oh, I've got to get everything. That's great. When that hype was at its highest, well, QuakeCon could be even higher, they pushed it out there, and therefore, marketing-wise, this is great. They got a lot of interested eyes on their product. Hey, awesome. A couple problems with that, though. The OST was not in production yet, first of all. Now, the game files and the OST are different, right? You can't just say, here's the game files, let's paste them in there, let's make an OST, da -da 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 done. Well... That's also another important talking point for later. These are separately crafted musical tracks like a song, not the in-game stems and files that go into the combat that twist in and out of the flow. There's a big distinction to be made there. 
Now, he learned about it in the media. When we talk about business practices, when you have someone that is heavily involved in a project, you want to let them know from the source. What if you were at your job or your school and someone else came up to you and said, hey, did you hear about X project on Y day? You know, you're going to be in it, right? Uh, first I've heard, this is a type of thing that you expect to hear from your boss or from your superior. It apparently happened that Mick did not. And I, this is the whole thing about the video. We need to put ourselves in Mick's shoes. Since I took a good view at the open letter two years ago when it came out, I want to take a look at the other side as well. I learned about it in the media. He put that in bold. So here's the thing. I want to read this paragraph. Please pay very close attention. I sent an urgent message to id Software saying that they had put me in a difficult position and we needed an agreement immediately to ensure customers would get their product. Contracts. Any time that you work on anything with your business, you need to have a contract. How important is that? Talking point number five that Mick provides says that everything he did was under a contract. He had an incident with a game back in 2015, Wolfenstein Old Blood probably, that had some issues with that contract and therefore everything that he wanted to do was on a contract, although there were delays from id's end, which is unfortunate. So since contracts are so important, I went and talked to my friend, found and explained. He's a YouTube channel with over 400,000 subscribers in two years, 48 videos with over 1 million views. This guy works with contracts frequently. He knows what he's doing. And here's what he had to say after he read the Mick Gordon issue. If someone doesn't send through a contract or delays, then you reiterate that they have pushed it back. Like say, okay, but you took a week to pay the deposit. So the new delivery date will be one week later. Then, if they complain, you say it's impossible or now you need even more time. Quote, happy to do it sooner for an extra fee as you want it faster. Because as we see here, the ball is in id Software's court. They want Mick to do this project. They're not giving him adequate time resources to do this project. Both of those things are finite. We only have so much time to do something as we will see for Mick here soon in the video. The problem was they wanted something but couldn't get this allotted time. So Mick has the power. He has the negotiation power to say, hey, you really want this from me? I'm going to need more time to do it. I will do it in your allotted time. I'm going to need more money for it. However, he did not do that. And given the situation around it, he felt pressured. He felt boxed in. He felt like, I got to do this. My name's attached to it, but I can't let him down like this. My, they already said my name's on it. OST strategy. Marty's response threw me. For reasons I still don't understand, he flatly denied me a contract and refused to do anything about the OST, saying he didn't want to cause a distraction, which they announced at E3, seeing one of the pre-orders with the product without an agreement or strategy. What would you do if you were in a situation to where you had something that needed done, but they didn't give you the adequate time and resources to do it? What precedence does this lay out for the gaming industry if something like this happens and it's okay? Will other people do it? Will other developers say, well, you know, we can get away with it. Let's do it some more. Now, again, this is a greater net. This is not just an id software issue here. We're talking about every game, every issue that could happen. Could this lay a precedent? Marty didn't want a distraction, but it did cause a giant distraction. So now we're stuck here. We're stuck here finishing the game. As we see, Doom, Devel Doom Eternal developers were crunching pretty hard for most of 2019. We know crunch culture exists in games. I mean, it's pretty much a natural part of it, unfortunately now, but if you have time, we can get that across. Now, overwhelming push to make the November 22nd release date. Development wore on and they even contemplated quitting because he, look at this, by the time he hit October, he hasn't received all the materials needed to finish the score. They hadn't paid me since January and still refused to talk about the OST. He had been in the works for months now, as had someone else, as if you read this, you'll see further, and he didn't have everything he needed a month before the release. I remember when Doom Eternal was announced on November 22nd, and then it was delayed back. We thought, well, maybe some things just weren't done with it yet. Maybe they need a little more time. Awesome. Delay it. Polish it up better. Would rather have that than an unfinished game. And now we see there's a lot more to it than we meets the eye. So the game was delayed, and that gave Mick some more breathing room. March 20th, 2020. During delaying the game was the right call. At this time, it was not polished or optimized. However... Its software rejected some of his previous work, and the mood turned sour. Now, they use an interesting term here. Now, all of this work that Mick had provided, some of it was rejected, and he was not paid for all of it. He was paid for half of the music, as we'll soon see. So you have the problem here of, I'm doing all this work. This pay is not coming through. This is starting to be a bad situation, but I don't want to abandon ship on it yet. Mick had a lot of power, being that the ball was in Id's court. However, he felt boxed in with what he had to do with it. That begins to be a problem. 
But no, according to them, I was the one being difficult. The word they used was ball ache, and they urged in no uncertain terms to carefully consider the destination my protest would lead to. Dire financial situation. This project had been my only source of income, and I couldn't afford to enter a dispute. Facing the possibility of not paying for 10 months at all, I relented and carry out their final demands. This is his main project. What if you, at your job, had some payment cut? You're like, this is the main thing I do. Yeah, I can go do odd jobs on the side, sure, but it's not going to give me the main source of finance that I need. His back was against the wall here. And again, I'm sure this has happened many other times in development and as gameplay people, we don't get it. As the gamers, we don't see it because all of this happens behind closed doors. For two years since that open letter was put out, we never knew any of this stuff was happening. So they finally turned up the money at the end of November, the first payment he'd received in 11 months. He was feeling unhappy and in a state of anxiety. He had to write the music for a purpose. Remember the example earlier, he was driving a car down a road that he didn't know anything about. So by the end of the project, he delivered more than double the minutes stated in the contract. Had no OST deal. What's going on here? Now, Mick and Marty, there is a little bit of discussion I've had with someone else we'll include here in just a minute. So Mick went on to realize that after Doom Eternal was released, its software used nearly all the music he produced throughout development while only paying for half of it. Now, he was. here's the thing we have to remember here. Mick is on the other side of the planet, as he said. He can't just walk into id Software's office and say, hey, what's going on here, guys? There's a huge time zone difference between USA and Australia. So there's a lot of disconnect, a lot of things that would make communication difficult, as well as feeling boxed in. There's just a lot of stuff here that is leading all you add it all up and you have a really difficult situation by each of these little parts. Rejected tracks. Everything that had to be an issue, its software refused to pay for it, and they had avoided approvals withholding pay. Remember the contracts we talked about. Contracts are important. You need to have everything signed, sealed, and delivered, but things were getting pushed back. He wants to work, but he can't without that contract because he could produce all this stuff without a signing contract. They could just say, oh, thanks, and nothing would be set in stone. That's what I think makes this issue difficult is because Mick has one side that he's pushing for, and he's getting a lot of pushback. This happens in other industries as well. So we know that back in 2015, as I mentioned earlier, Mick had some project that he was working on and that they wanted him to do it and then deliver the contract and everything. After that, he trusted it and that did not work. As he says, don't ever work without a contract. That's been like a key point of this video to have everything set in stone. And it appears that it was. So if it is set in stone and something goes wrong, what happens? Now we see here that the OST contract negotiations with Bethesda are addressed. Now, Marty claimed that this was the agreed deal. What was the agreed deal? A comprehensive album, 30 tracks, runtime of over two hours. He wanted to have it be like Doom 2016's OST. This suggestion was shot down within a matter of hours. 12 songs is what he was contracted for, and as we know, the OST has many more than that. There is a whole list of things. The April 16th ideal deadline but they will be happy to amend the contract later. So as you've seen, the main thing we've been focusing on in our talk here is how Mick was treated. And if you continue to read all of the things he says, they've been working on an alternate OST without him for six months. This is his project he really wants involved. I mean, how would you feel if someone else had just been cutting under you for the past six months? I know there's always more to the story, so I wanna make sure we go over everything that I need to here. The metadata showed it. There's no getting around it. I mean, it was worked on. And as we continue on, it's not up to standard. You see these, him lay down, the deadline was imminent, everything pushed through. What happens when all of this hits the fan, they release the OST, and it's not up to the standard? People realized, people pulled up the files and said, this does not match up with what it should. It is not what we expected. Now, all of this was supposed to be smooth. The whole process works. But it didn't. I mean, it works till it doesn't, right? One of the most blaring questions that I have out of this whole thing, I, we've talked about communications, we talk about contracts, everything not being up to standards. The people and the ideas that we had about the way Marty handled situations from the id Software employee that worked with him, all of that sounds great. All of our experience with him over these past years. Yet, this is such a lapse in character judgment. I just, I want to know, I wish I could talk to Marty and say, hey, I understand there's a disconnect here. What happened? Like the Marty we knew or thought we knew and this Marty are completely different people. I, I don't understand it. And I've made posts, I've talked about it and everyone's saying, fire Marty, get rid of him, you know, screw him, all that stuff. I'm not going to say that. They're saying that because they're upset and I get that. Look, what he did in this situation with Mick's letter here is rough and I just don't understand 
what that disconnect is. There is a thing called tribalism in which the people of a company, they're more tight-knit than the contractors that are across the world. However, you would expect or hope that these behaviors between both of these people would be the same. It doesn't matter if you're an id software employee. It doesn't matter if you're a contractor. Where did that disconnect come in the middle along the way? Did something happen to trigger that? I just don't understand why there's such a big difference between the two Martys. And, and what else baffles me is that this open letter that was posted, when it came out two years ago, it, Mick and Marty had an agreement like, hey, we'll talk this out, everything will be fine, and then this open letter comes out and completely throws Mick out, surprises him so much. Everything in this letter when it came out, everybody was like, oh, this makes sense. Mick, you screwed up, man. You're a great composer. You missed the deadlines. What are you doing? You messed up. Sorry, Marty. You're good to go, dude. Well, a few people were like, well, this letter doesn't actually add up. I have nothing else to go off of by my own intuition. Okay, we're just going to let it slide for now. And then two years later, out of the blue, dropped the bomb. Totally unexpected. Now, the way Marty had seemed to handle this was they wanted to pull this down. They wanted to pull this whole letter down. There were lies in it. There were bad things. And he didn't want to do it. They got lawyers involved. I mean, this is a serious deal here. They even tried to pull it down at one point, and then it came back up like 12 hours later, which I think personally, this is just my opinion, that when it was pulled down by the Reddit mod of the Doom subreddit, who is no longer with the mod team, he deleted his account, it was put back up. I think that the mod had some legal pressure against him, because people were saying, you know, why'd you give in? Why'd you put it back up? That's dumb. You're supposed to keep it down. Well, hey, look, if you were an unpaid volunteer for a website for a game that you love, and someone had a big company bringing legal issue to you, you would probably listen through fear. Whether that was founded, unfounded, or not, if someone is going to sue you and you don't have all the information on the situation, you're probably going to put it back up and listen. At least I think most people would. And you could just go through this and see thing after thing, back and forth, a meltdown. And, and this is the part we need to... I, this is the part that we need to talk about, okay? They tried to sign an agreement. Mick was given six figures of hush money, or offered it, rather. This means that... I will pay you six figures, and, and I don't think people really, we, we say six figures, but I don't think people really understand the gravity of that, okay? You can retire with today's dollars off of a million bucks. With a 3%, three to 4% rule, you can live off of 30 grand a year. It's about 2,500 a month before taxes. You can live off of a million bucks without having to work a day in your, in your life, assuming a lot of things with the market. That's a whole other thing. Six figures is a lot of money. That is life-changing. Like, that is a big deal for Mick to turn down, unless he had other savings, other investments, other things that he could fall back on. That is huge. Now, hush money is important because the deals say he can't share any of the music he provided from the game, remove the mention from the portfolio, bury the issue, keep the post up indefinitely, no comment if Mick ever had anything else to say about it, never badmouth Marty or anything else or anyone else working under it. That's interesting, too, because I had spoken to some individuals about this, and apparently you can't actually do that. Uh, it's illegal by some states. I am not a lawyer, but if you can't necessarily tell someone, hey, don't badmouth, don't criticize. There's a lot of things and situations, the way this was handled, that just really make you have a red flag. And I, I had a post recently, and people were saying, you're a Marty apologist, basically. That's why I said this video is so much more complicated than me making one or two community posts on my YouTube channel to try to cover. I respect Marty for working on Doom. I have been a fan of this series for 30 years. Clearly, they did some things right with him at the helm and Hugo at the helm to make this work. I don't like the way this all came down, so please let me clarify my post. I respect Marty for working on Doom. I respect Hugo. I respect all the animators, all everyone, for working on making this project that has been with me for 30 years. I don't like the way this was handled, and I don't understand the change. It's like it's two different Martys from who we hear, and I know that we don't know everybody truly. I just feel like this disconnect is strange. Everyone else, seemingly, the person that I spoke to, thought this was strange. This was out of left field. This was not the Marty they knew. I just, I wish I could talk to him. Mick told him, screw off. He was not going to sign it. The truth is more important. Seriously. He wanted to be able to make this letter and put this out here over 20,000 retweets later. People that aren't even involved in the Doom scene are covering this in their news. Like, this is a big deal. You have Pyrocynical, you have Nick Nocturnal, you have PC Gamer, all these articles. That's why, going way back to the beginning of the video, I said, 
this issue goes beyond just doom. This is not just our little bubble anymore, guys. This is a bigger thing here. There are other practices in the industry that are happening, and this is bringing them to light. This is not just a doom thing. And I just, I want to be able, be able to address this here, okay? Mick specifically said, don't do a hate smear campaign. And people did. Sharing his personal details on message boards, email bombing him, harassing other clients, called his phone numbers around the clock, screaming messages full of abuse. Now, I'm just going to read this here. I, I encourage you to read the screen because I'm going to have to change a couple words. I began receiving specific expressions of violence. The content so vivid it made me sick. The torrent of abuse telling me how to off myself, how I'd be mutilated, they would circulate photos of my body to traumatize my family, how my family would be murdered, how they'd hurt my animals, how they'd shoot up any event I attended, how I would be sexually assaulted to death, really started to wear me down in ways I couldn't previously imagine. What in the world did I just read? What is that? That is not the... This is not the way it should be. So, yes, we've been talking about the way Marty handled things. But as a community, we can't do things like that. That is... That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm moving on. I, that's all I have to say about that. He had a lot of strain on it. Delays, stalling tactics. The whole situation is a mess. It's just, the whole situation is a mess. There's no way around it. Like, it sucks to be in Marty's shoes right now for obvious reasons. It sucks to be in Mick's shoes. It sucks for us as the players we never got the OST, which is like minutia, minor little things compared to what we saw with Mick here. It's just a mess. And there's so much more. Not everything is black and white. That's why we have to actually look at it, talk about it. It's so much more than what it might seem. Now there was hope, right? Microsoft got Zenimax. What are we going to do? This is possible. Are they going to fire Marty? Like I said, companies, if it affects their bottom line, if it is a better look for said company, they don't care who they fire. They don't care that Marty is an executive director at its software. They are looking at it from up here and taking care of what needs to be done down here to make everything smooth out. That being said, I would love to see a redemption story. I would love to see something turn around. It's software give a great response. Everything look great. You know, Marty say, hey, I'm sorry. We're going to make everything right from now on. Maybe I live in a perfect idealized world or, or some utopia that I want to be in. I, I don't know. I know I understand that probably nothing will be said. Because the way Mick made this letter, it's like a, a trap. As someone I spoke to said that, there's no way to respond to this and be like smooth. This is a carefully laid out plan and Mick did very well with it. I would just love to see that other side. I do not want to see Marty fighter. I would love to see a, a redemption story. Perfect world maybe, but I just wish that would happen. Obviously, positive outcome, right? I would just love to see a response. I would love it. I just don't know what they would say, but I'd love to see it. The final offer... So for the second time he proposed, I would produce a better version of the Doom Eternal OST, but in return, Marty would need to take down the post. It did not happen. They gave six figures of hush money. The tensions got worse. Everything was bad. He attempted to remove the post himself whenever they knew that he wasn't going to give in. He, it just everything is rough. I mean, that, that's, that's the whole thing about this. He's not attacking Marty, and neither am I, and neither should any of us be attacking Marty. We should be giving. I have said this for the past forever. It's this discussion. Nice, level-headed discussion like this is the way to go. Do not burn Marty at the stake. Do not, don't. I know it's bad. I know it sucks. I do not support any of it. I want to know everything goes on the full side of the story. We're not going to get that full side, and that is fine. I never quit Doom. I quit a toxic client. That is it. Mick goes on all of these letters. He's been working on this for a while, two years in the making. Everything is laid out right here. I wish we had a better resolution. I wish we knew more. I wish things went differently, but you know what? You can't change the past. All you can do, take what you have now, move forward with it, learn from it. Other gaming industry issues happen just like this all the time. We never know about them. Thankfully, Mick turned down six figures of life-changing money that he could live off of, invest for his future, and said this. He didn't have to. He could have took the money. It would have hurt his reputation. It would have sucked. He would have had to live with this and sleep with it every night. But you know what? He didn't do it. That's commendable. I don't... Uh, that's a lot of money. That's... I, I just don't... under. If you're older here you, and you've been established in your career field for a while, you would maybe see like that's a lot of money. That's years of work. If you're younger, you would be able to invest that for the next 30, 40 years and do really, really well for yourself. I wish things were better. I wish it was good. But you know what? I want to know what you think in the comments below. Let me know down here. Check out the video on my screen here. And thank you so much for watching this video.